Nathan, I've had you on the show before for an hour-long treatment of your story. I will link that in the, in the show notes. It's a fantastic conversion story. I think it figures in a bit to how we read the Bible, because you, of course, were a Protestant pastor steeped in the Bible, uh, and became Catholic. So I wonder if, for, for a few minutes at least, give us maybe the, the Coles notes of your conversion story uh, from a Protestant pastor to a Catholic biblical theologian. How did that happen in, in a nutshell? Yes, sure. So I was a um, pastor in a place very close to Canada called Michigan, and uh, <laughs> equally cold as much of Canada. Like there's warmer parts of Canada, yeah. to be sure, than Michigan, yeah. like maybe Vancouver. But anyway, um, so I was a pastor in West Michigan, and um, oh yeah, boy. Uh, so my, my father was a was a navy chaplain so i was you know strongly impressed by his example and wanted to be a protestant pastor myself although did not want to go into the military but um uh so i uh went through seminary went to protestant seminary was serving a church and uh keith it's interesting that in the process of doing that protestant ministry i began to doubt certain fundamental protestant concepts like uh, sola fide, um, is salvation by faith alone. I found that when I taught that to people or evangelized on the basis of sola fide or faith alone, people frequently took it to mean that they had to give intellectual consent to the idea of Jesus being Lord or God or something like this. And then after that, their moral behavior did not need to be transformed. Right, they yeah, didn't yeah. need to enter into a life of discipleship with Christ, you know, of taking up one's cross daily and denying oneself and following the Lord. And so I had a hard time, uh, practically speaking, making the transition between these ways of preaching the gospel based on faith alone and then the life of discipleship. And the more I looked at the New Testament, I realized it doesn't, the New Testament itself and Jesus himself, this is what primarily bothered me, Jesus does not preach a gospel of salvation by faith alone. People want to come after them, after him, and he says things like, you need to count the cost. Yeah. You know, uh, no man, you know, sets about building a tower before counting the cost, etc. So it, he actually discourages people from flippantly following him, where we, whereas we were chasing after people and trying to sign, sign people up, as it were, with a soft sell of what the commitment really was in terms of being a, a Christian. So that bothered me quite a bit. The, um, the fact that more and more I realized uh, salvation by faith alone was not a scriptural ev emphasis, wasn't even a scriptural teaching per se. And then uh, other things like um, the idea of the Bible alone or sola scriptura, the Bible alone being, you know, our only source of knowledge of the faith. Um, the difficulty there, Keith, was I, I looked at my fellow pastors and saw such a multitude of different interpretations, not on insignificant things other either, uh, you know, on, on significant issues like what baptism is and what it does for you and when you should receive it, uh, the moral teaching of marriage, you know, what, what are the boundaries of marriage, divorce and remarriage, sexuality outside of marriage, you know, major... Uh, issues that affected how one lived one's life and and how one's uh, path of discipleship with the Lord Jesus Christ was shaped on these major issues that found pastors and theologians all uh, ostensibly um, you know paying lip service to sola scripture or the Bible alone and, and coming to these widely differing positions that were mutually contradictory and some people were okay with mutual contradiction but when I read John 17, Jesus' prayer for unity before the beginning of the Passion, it seemed clear to me that Jesus' vision of the church was not one in which people were at loggerheads over virtually every uh, dogmatic, sacramental, you know, and pastoral issue. And that's what I observed within Protestantism around me. So all this chaos of scriptural interpretation, I, th I thought to myself, this can't be correct. Jesus must have left us something more than simply the Bible in order to maintain the unity of the church. And he's clearly concerned about the unity of the church, as you see in John 17 and elsewhere. So, uh, Keith, I, I lost my faith in those in those two pillars, at least, uh, if not others, of the Protestant Reformation. 
uh, about this time, um, be because of these doubts I was having, these theological doubts, I decided to postpone my pastoral career and go back to school and get another doctoral degree, another de a graduate degree, this time a doctorate in scripture. I applied to all these schools in, in God's province. Um, the, the, the most receptive, most enthusiastic school that offered me the best package was the University of Notre Dame, uh, a Catholic institution, obviously, in South Bend, Indiana. And they had a ecumenical faculty. Um, and so I could study with Protestants and be paid by a Catholic institution. So, hey, you know, it's like robbing the Egyptians. I thought that was a sweet <laughs> deal. So I go down to the University of Notre Dame and I begin my doctorate there. And there I meet, met this guy uh, who I like to say had three qualities I never thought I'd see in the same person. He was highly intelligent, full of the Holy Spirit and Catholic. And I didn't see how you could combine those three. Uh, you know, I've met whole... Uh, spirit-filled Catholics before, but it didn't seem like their elevator went to the top floor. I'd met intelligent Catholics before, but they're almost always nominal and cynical and secularized. Um, I had met intelligent, spirit-filled people before, but they had always been Protestant. So intelligent, spirit-filled, Catholic, that was a new combination for me. And I was just floored by this walking contradiction named Michael. And uh, so we began to um, meet weekly to discuss Protestant Catholic issues. Um, he defended the Catholic faith in a very unfair and underhanded way, namely by citing scripture, uh, which <laughs> I, I just thought was, was against the rules of the game. Somewhere there was, a you know, the rules of Protestant Catholic dialogue was, I'm the Protestant. I get to cite scripture. The Catholic guy gets to cite church documents or something like that. But here he is using the Bible against me um, on, on issues of the sacraments and so on. But, you know, inside, I was actually quite impressed. And the more that we met together and the more I saw his knowledge of scripture and his ability to defend the Catholic faith from scripture, uh, the more this was unsettling uh, my Protestant convictions and ma making me really open to hearing about the Catholic faith, but it wasn't quite enough because in the end, it was just like arguing with Baptists or Methodists. I was uh, a Dutch Calvinist. Um, and so, you know, uh, there's all these other Protestant groups with their ways of interpreting the scripture. And so with Michael, I became impressed that he could defend the Catholic approach from scripture, but hey, Methodists could defend their position from scripture and Lutherans theirs and Calvinists theirs. And so everybody can defend themselves from scripture. So it wasn't enough to put me over the edge. But Michael said, look, why don't we go to the earliest church fathers, the ones that knew the apostles, read their writings and allow them to really cast the deciding vote between our two opposing positions, really see, you know, do they come down on a Catholic or a Protestant side of these major issues that are dividing us? And so we began to read Clement of Rome and St. Ignatius of Antioch. And when I got to St. Ignatius of Antioch, who's writing 10 years after the death of St. John the Apostle, he's writing in the year 106, so extremely early in Christian history, within living memory of the apostles themselves. And he himself, Ignatius, was the bishop of Antioch, so the chief pastor of the churches of Antioch and Syria. And he was being taken to Rome for his martyrdom. And as he passed by the city of Smyrna in uh, Asia Minor, now modern-day Turkey, he dashed off a letter to the local church and warned them about various heresies. And there was one line that ended up really striking home to me. He, t he tells these early Christians, stay away from anyone who refuses to confess the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, which suffered for our sins and which the Father raised for our salvation. And uh, I read that again, uh, stay away from anyone who refuses to confess the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ, which, not who, not who suffered, but which suffered. So the grammatical antecedent is the flesh, not Jesus, okay? The flesh which suffered, the flesh which was raised by the Father for our salvation. And it dawned on me, uh, there is no possible way to get a symbolic interpretation out of what he just said. 
In fact, he's ruling out symbolic interpretations. He's saying that people that think it's just a symbol are not true Christians, and you ought to stay away from them because they don't have the true faith. And then it dawned on me that if I had jumped in a time machine and went back to 100, the year 100, I would be a heretic. I would not be considered a true Christian because my doctrinal standards insisted that the Catholic Mass was a condemnable idolatry. That's actual language that we used in our doctrinal statements as Dutch Calvinists, that the Mass was a condemnable idolatry because in it bread and wine were worshipped as if they were God. Of course they aren't. They're just creations, and so it's the worship of a created item. It's idolatry. So we, we out, you know, foundational to our identity was the denial of the real presence of the Eucharist. That's part of what made us Dutch Calvinists. And that would have made us heretics. It still really makes us heretics, honestly. We're too polite to use that term anymore. But really, it is a heresy to deny the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And again, I was convicted that if I went back to the early church, I would not have been considered a true Christian. And I wanted to be a true Christian according to the standards of early Christians, of the apostles and the first pastors of the church and these early my martyrs. I wanted to share the same faith that led all these Christians to give their lives in the arena and willingly be eaten by beasts rather than deny their faith in Jesus Christ. That was the faith that I wanted to have. And that faith began with the conviction of Jesus's real presence uh, in the Eucharist. And so I converted on that issue within 36 hours. I had decided in my heart I needed to become Catholic. It might be sooner, it might be later, but it was going to happen. And, um, and and the rest was just, you know, the playing out of, of that conviction. It took about 18 months to go through the whole process and, you know, be received formally into the church and with my wife and many conversations with my wife and all kinds of other interesting things. But that was the heart of it, really, the testimony of the earliest of the fathers to the real presence of Christ. And, of course, that's the literal sense of the entire New Testament on the Eucharist. Is, is just that it is his flesh, just the simple, plain meaning of the words in the Gospels and in Paul's letters, you know, it's just is his body. So it's the literal sense of scripture, it's the obvious conviction of the earlier and later fathers, so who am I to argue with what scripture plainly says and what, what the fathers affirm likewise, I, I cannot argue with testimony like that. <laughs> well said, Dr. Bergsmo, well said.